the Holy Gospel according to Mark, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked them, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I have talked before about a book I read many years ago by Otto Bettman entitled The Good Old Days. They were terrible. Many of us love to reminisce about how life used to be. But the truth is, life in the good old days was hard for most people. We forget that there have always been wars and rumors of wars and droughts and floods and fires and natural disasters. And the ability to respond to the devastation was far worse 100 years ago. Working conditions and sanitation were deplorable, especially for poor immigrants and others who lived in large cities. And never mind the absence of things we take for granted, like indoor plumbing and hot and cold running water and refrigerators to keep our food and air conditioners to cool our homes. No, health care in the good old days was horrible. You can talk to some of our older members and ask them about how they and their loved ones suffered from illnesses and conditions that are now easily treated or prevented. Advances in medical science have drastically improved our quality of life and our life expectancy. Or spend some time walking through our cemetery. It's very sobering to notice how often infants and children were buried here less than 100 years ago. In many ways, the good old days were terrible. Nevertheless, life was simpler and in many, many ways more innocent. Older folks will also uh, remember going to bed at night without locking their doors or windows. And I do long for the days when kids could walk to school or play outside all day long and not come home until it was time for dinner and parents never had to worry about them being abducted. There was a sense of peace and security. This morning, the hearts of civilized people around the world are aching for the people in Paris and we will pray for them this morning. Over 100 people murdered by terrorists. Two weeks ago over 200 people die on a Russian airliner that explodes in the air more than likely due to a bomb on board. Yes, life has changed 
since the towers fell and our Pentagon was attacked on September 11th, 2001. It seems the threat of terrorism and violence is everywhere. And in this country, one shooting rampage after another has caused parents even to fear for their children's safety at school. We live in a broken and sin-filled world. But as Christians, we are called to live by faith in this world. We are called to thank, praise, honor, and serve our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in this world. How is that possible? In today's gospel lesson, the disciples are impressed with a magnificent new temple building built by Herod the Great. It was larger than any previous temple, and it was more than simply a beautiful building. The temple was a sign of God's presence with Israel. The temple was a symbol of their identity as people of God. And when Jesus tells them that the temple will be destroyed and not one stone left upon another, it was like someone predicting that the White House and the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. would be destroyed. Now, the world as the disciples knew it was going to come to an end, just as the world we knew it came to an end on 9-11. And like us, the disciples try to figure out how to live in such uncertain and trying and dangerous times. And they asked Jesus to tell them the signs that will precede the end of the world as they know it. They believe that if they know the future, they will be able to deal with it. The present might be uncertain, but if they know what to expect in the future, they can live with that uncertainty. Lots of people today, lots of Christian people, think they can find security in trying to predict the future. A week or two ago, you may have heard in the news about the Supreme Court case involving a Texas family that homeschools their children. The parents claimed that learning anything beyond what can be learned in Sunday school is irrelevant because the second coming of Jesus and the end of the world is imminent. I'm reminded again of the Left Behind series of books that was popular a few years ago. They are pure fiction, and they're based upon horrible biblical interpretation. And if you're interested, I can recommend a book by Lutheran theologian Barbara Rossing that completely refutes those who use the Bible to predict the so-called rapture and the apocalypse. I always try to speak respectfully about brothers and sisters in Christ from other traditions who read the Bible differently. But I'm sorry, the whole business about the rapture and using the Bible to predict the end of the world is pure nonsense. You might as well look at the stars or consult a crystal ball. Jesus told his disciples that there will be wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famines. Those calamities were common in Jesus' day, and 2,000 years later, they are still common. He was not giving his disciples the inside track on knowing the future. He was telling them that they didn't need to know the future, only the one who holds the future in his hands. The future will be filled with trials and tribulations just like the present. We will continue as we have breath to live in a broken and sin-filled world. And there are no secrets hidden in the Bible that can be deciphered and decoded to predict the future. And wasting your time trying to do so is the antithesis of living by faith. To live by faith is to trust in God who holds the future in his hands. 
Faith does not ensure that our lives will always be comfortable and affluent and without tragedy. Faith assures that come what may, whatever we face, God will be with us. The God of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, generosity, faithfulness, self-control. Faith is not simply holding on and longing to go to heaven when we die. No, faith leads us to serve God by serving other people right here and now so that others see and experience the presence of God and the presence of those fruits of God's Spirit and the reign of God in this world through us. That's our mission, brothers and sisters in Christ. When asked what he would do if he knew the world was going to end tomorrow, Martin Luther replied that he would go out and plant a tree today. The future belongs to God. Luther was saying that he would live by faith trusting in God and serving God in exactly the same way, whether the end is tomorrow or a thousand years from now. May God grant us grace and the wisdom to live by faith day by day. May we follow the example of Luther and countless Christians who have gone before us as we gather and worship and grow in the word and serve God by serving people never knowing if this is our last day or not, but confident that God, Emmanuel, is and always will be with us. Your future in Christ is secure. Amen.